ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good evening. My name is Mateusz Paukowski and I'm deputy head of the Pilecki Institute Berlin uh, and convener of our seminar. This uh, Pfizer Platz seminar is because of the pandemic not at Pfizer Platz in Berlin, but online. Our distinguished guest, Professor Philip Sanz, is with us from London. Katia Riemann is in Berlin, and I am now in Warsaw. We started uh, this Berlin branch of the Pilecki Institute at Pfizer Platz uh, in September last year, with aim to provide new perspectives on history of 20th century, in particular, history of Poland and the war. From the very beginning, we recognize that historical research also requires the methodologies and imagination of other fields, of other social sciences. And we include not only research carried out by historians, but also by writers, sociologists, anthropologists, or scholars of law. In this context, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest today. Uh, the first guest uh, is Philip Sands of University College London. He is professor in the field of international law and author of the prize-winning book about Lvov lawyers Rafał Lenkin and Hersch Lauterbach, the originators of the concept of genocide and crimes against humanity, respectively. Philip has just written another important book, The Rap Line, Love, Lies, and Justice on the Trial of Nazi Fugitive. And it was published this year. This truly detective historical investigation concerns the family of Otto Wächter, who served as Nazi governor of Krakow and then in Lwów as governor of the district of Galicia, becoming responsible for the crimes committed in occupied Poland. And after the war, he managed to escape justice. This book is the reason why we are here. Uh, as I said, Philip in London, me in Warsaw, and from Berlin, there's with us our uh, great German actress, Katja Riemann. Katja starred, among others, in the film Rosenstrasse, also the, the film about the history of Nazi time. And she's also a book author. Uh, she published just this year published uh, mm, the book Jeder hat niemanda Projekt Reisen, published this year by uh, Fischer Verlag about non governmental organizations as change agents and uh, good people as change agents active in Congo, Lebanon, and other parts of the world. And we are happy to, to have. Katya also with us. Uh, she, uh, she knows Philip's work very well. And uh, I would like to make this conversation between our two guests. Philip, uh, for me, uh, your book resembles a, a little bit a travel journal. And not only because you have traveled the world collecting materials and talking to people, how long did this complicated journey in the footsteps of Otto Wächter last? And why, first, first of all, why did you embark upon it? Thank you, Matej. And it's incredibly nice to be with you today in Warsaw and in Berlin, although I'm speaking from you in lockdown. Uh, in London, and I just want to begin by thanking my good friend Katya. It's incredibly nice to be doing this uh, with you, and what a privilege that we're on this together, part of the sort of the new Europe, the reconciled Europe that looks with an honest eye uh, the stories that touch all of us, in, often in different ways. So this is a story that begins in 2010. I receive an invitation to give a lecture in the city that was once called Lemberg, or once called Lvov, still called Lvov, still called Lemberg, but today Lviv in the Ukraine, to give a lecture on the work that I do as a lawyer and as an academic on crimes against humanity and genocide. And the real reason that I accepted the invitation was that I wanted to find the house where my grandfather was born in 1904 in Lvov. 
Um, I found it. I found many other things. I found his Polish passport. Uh, Mateusz, you may be surprised to know that I'm eligible for Polish citizenship uh, on the basis of my grandfather's Polish nationality. Um, <laughs> and opening that door, uh, I came across uh, a lot of amazing individuals and coincidences that the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide began in the law faculty in Lwów with these two Polish Jewish jurists, Lemkin and Lauterpacht. And I started writing a book about the three men, Lauterpacht, Lemkin and my grandfather. And into the story came a fourth man, Hans Frank, because he came to Lemberg as it then was in 1942. And in the aula of what had been the Jan Kazimierz University Law School, he announced the implementation of the final solution, the extermination of hundreds of thousands of Jews and Poles. And I made Frank the fourth man in my story. I came to know his son, Nicholas, <coughs> who is uh, living in Hamburg and is a wonderful person and has become a, a very good friend. Uh, and one day, uh, Nick Frank said to me, you know, you're interested in Lemberg, Lvov, Lviv. Maybe you would like to meet my friend, Horst Wächter. He is the son of Otto Wächter, who is my father's deputy. And I met Horst for the first time in early 2012. He has different views from Nicholas. Nicholas despises his father. Horst tries to find the good in his father. But nevertheless, I liked Horst. He's an honest man. He's a decent person. And we came to know each other. We did little projects together. I wrote a profile of him in the Financial Times. We then made a film together, which you can see on Amazon and Netflix sometimes and other places called My Nazi Legacy, and then a podcast, and then finally this book, The Rat Line. But the heart of this book is that in 2015, Horst decided to give me a copy of his parents' entire archive. Uh, this is Charlotte, his mother, and Otto, his father. Their letters, their diaries, their personal documents. From the moment they met in 1929 on a railway carriage in Vienna, to the moment Otto Wächter died in mysterious circumstances in the summer of 1949. When the war ended on the 9th of May, 1945, unlike Hans Frank, Wächter was caught. Uh, Wächter escaped. Frank was caught, Wächter escaped. Uh, and he went on the run. And I used the material to uncover not only what he had done during his time as gouverneur in Krakow and then in Lwów, uh, Lemberg, but subsequently what had happened and how he had escaped, who helped him, where he went, and how finally, right at the end of his life, he tried to get to South America on the uh, Reich migratory route that is known as uh, the Rat Line in the English uh, language. Uh, and the book will be published in German by Fischer Verlag um, in November of this year and in Polish also. I think at the end of this year or early uh, next year. And that in a nutshell is the story. Uh, you could call it uh, a thriller. You could call it a legal narrative. You could call it a Cold War espionage story. But for me, ultimately, what it is more than anything in a curious way is a love story. Because in a sense, it's the great untold story of this period the relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, and how the two lived through this extraordinary and terrible period. And in particular, the unknown accomplices to the horror are the partners uh, who not only turned a blind eye, but often encouraged and celebrated the joys of owning properties and looting art uh, and you know from the material we'll talk about now some of the extraordinary discoveries that I made. In writing the book, I've had the assistance of some extraordinary young scholars and people um, in London, but also in Poland, in Germany, in Austria, and I express my deep gratitude to them because a project like this, which is multilingual and which crosses from you know, law and history and sociology to memoir and biography, and drama even, and Katya can tell us all about that, cannot be done without people who absolutely have a mastery of the language that is at issue 
in each of the places where this story happens. You're right, it could also be a travelogue because I spent time traveling all the way across uh, much of Europe and indeed into the United States. Mm -hmm. Katya, so what, uh, what reading of the book was for you most important? Philip mentioned that there are several, several interpretations of uh, impossible of this book. So as a love story, as a Lego story or espionage uh, book in the Cold War. So what uh, this book is for you? So what surprised maybe you the most in this story? What did you feel, for example, sympathy for these bad guys, which this book is full of? So first of all, let me thank you as well for this invitation, you know, to be here again and to see my wonderful friend from London, Philip Sands, and we're on tour since more than four years, I assume, with his first book, which is called um, uh, East West Street, about uh, crimes against humanity and genocide, and I feel so honored that we're together in this uh, performance. So, well, um, it's interesting you ask me this, uh, if I feel any sympathy for one of the bad guys, maybe because I'm German, I don't know. So first, let me say this, because Philip can say that uh, because about his own book. I think it's an unbelievable read. And it's a read that you can do even if you're not a historian or a lawyer. So even if you don't know that much about this uh, period of time, you can start reading it. Why? Because it's non-fiction, it's a non-fiction book, but it's written like a fiction book anyway. You know, it's a, whatever, if it is a crime story or you call it a thriller or a love story, this is because he really approaches the people who are kind of staring in it, the cast. So he brings to life all these people that he's talking about and making them three-dimensional and not missing out their education or their ability or their love for the arts, for example. And this is probably the most thing that surprises me if you ask me about that. You know, this is, and this is not just in this book, this is the horror of the history of that country that I was born in, that there were so many educated people who could, as Hans Frank, for example, play a beautiful piano and who, knew the arts and loved the arts and literature and had this strong anti-Semitism and were killing people and then writing love letters in the evening to their dear wife, not even mentioning once what their job is. You know, and this is, and let me just add this, um, I find it so because, you know, because being German, of course, I, I read so many books about this. I made a lot of fun about this. And still, there are, there's no answer to this question. How could that happen for me? Um, oh no, I lost my time for one. Um, so, sorry, I lost my, I, I, I forgot what I wanted to say. Oh, no, I know. No, because so, so often I hear in conversations, maybe this is the same in Poland or in England, I don't know, but so very often I hear the word, well, there were demons. What was happening? There were animals. No, these Nazis, they were people. They were educated lawyers and family, fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters. They had a life. They loved. And we can compare them with monsters because then they, we would reduce what they actually did. You know, and, and for me, what is important for me is to look back and to know what was happening and to see how it all started and how they were supported by all European countries, if I may say this, to be prepared for what's happening now and in the future. You know, to maybe, yeah, to maybe, say stop this is happening again and we all know what's happening in europe and not just in europe right now you know there's there's you know it's time to to reflect about other times to hopefully prevent us from going even more into the right uh right wing area yes mm -hmm. uh, philip uh, philip uh, so 
could, what could you tell us more? So who was this Vesta family? So what was the background and when, how did you found? Did you find maybe, so where exactly this evil part was embedded in, uh, in their background or education or something like that? I mean, Katja makes a really important point. Um, I at no point describe Wächter in this book or Hans Frank in the other book as monsters because I think they were not just monsters. They were also people who loved and enjoyed the arts and were parents and lovers and friends and they did good things also. And they were in some ways ordinary folk. They were intelligent, they were highly educated, they were cultivated. And it is the great mystery. And of course, it raises a question for all of us. What would I have done? Could I do this in some circumstances? And can I put my hand on my heart and exclude the possibilities? And that was why the first part of the book, I wanted to go into their backgrounds. Who were they? Um, Otto Wächter, born in 1901, Austrian, uh, the son of a military man, General Joseph Wächter, who became actually government minister in the 1920s. He had a perfectly... Um, decent, uh, you know, upper middle class upbringing. Uh, he went to good schools. He was a student at the University of Vienna Law Faculty. Indeed, remarkably, he entered the law faculty at the University of Vienna uh, on the same day, uh, at the same time as Hirsch Lauterpacht, whose family he was later responsible uh, for the killing for. In fact, I did a remarkable event last December that touched me very much. I think Kirsten von Lingen is, is on this is amongst the audience here and I was very affected by doing an event on the centenary of his arrival at the law school uh -huh. uh, and afterwards it's up the greasy pole his uh, he crosses lines very early he in 1921 is already convicted and sentenced to a week imprisonment for um, for the act of uh, beating up Jews 1923 he joins the Nazi party um, he becomes a lawyer he becomes active in the Nazi party. 1934, uh, he kills, uh, is participant in the killing of Chancellor Dolphus uh, in Austria, uh, and he flees to Germany. In the meantime, he has met Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte uh, is not impecunious. Charlotte comes from a steel-making family in Mürzerschlag in Austria, um, and she's well-to-do. She comes and studies in England for a year when she's 17 years old. And then... Um, she meets Otto Wächter while she's a student at an art school designing fabrics. And she's a very fine artist. She works with Josef Hoffmann in the Wiener Werkstätte. Uh, so these are, these are, you know, cultivated people, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps not intellectuals, but smart, hardworking, and committed in the 1930s to a Nazi future. They are absolutely uh, uh, committed ideologically to the Nazi uh, ideals. Uh, Adolf Hitler is their great hero and they are deeply anti-Semitic and they've been anti-Semitic for a long time. And beyond that, they are anti-certain others. I mean, by the time Wächter arrives in Krakow um, in uh, the autumn of 1939, after the war begins, he uh, is embarked on a program to eliminate Polish intellectuals. He's involved in the famous act of, you know, the roundup of the Polish academics from the university in Krakow in the autumn of 1939. And then one of the very few exceptions actually to the, um, to, to the, to the uh, silences of the correspondence, which is very striking, is a famous letter from December 1939, where he does write home to his wife Charlotte, who is still in Austria at that point in Vienna. And he says, my darling, it's marvelous. Um, the Wiener Philharmonic has been here. Um, the uh, party leaders have been here. It's a great time. It's a great time for me. There's a little bit of local difficulty. There's been an attack on Hans Frank. And tomorrow I have to have 50 poles shot. And I, being a lawyer by training, I know where to go and look for material. And I, I had read somewhere that there was an archive in which the act of killing that he described was recorded with photographs. In fact, it's a notorious act of killing. It took place in a Polish town called Bocznia. It is still commemorated uh, each year, uh, 75 years later, uh, and uh, 80 years later. And um, I found the photographs in an archive in Warsaw, which shows uh, Otto Wächter overseeing the 
dread for execution as an act of reprisal, a crime under international law. And those photographs, uh, I thought, might shift Horst Wächter, uh, might cause him to recognize that his father was not just a sort of cog in a giant Nazi wheel, but that he was a willing, knowing, and active participant. And you see him in the photographs, uh, yeah. supervising the execution of 50 young Polish men. It's an absolutely shocking image, a dreadful image. And it tells the entire story of Otto Wächter in black and white in one tiny picture. Yeah, and this is, I found, uh, I found this really, in fact, really interesting and what Katya said and what you said, so that for me, this uh, most powerful element of your book was this co-joining of information about everyday life of Charlotte and Otto, about all these concerts, operas, trips, and tennis courts, and which selected information about mass murder. But uh, so I, uh, I would uh, uh, ask Katya, so be uh, because uh, there is the particular moment of Anschluss, uh, of uh, so in the year 1938, and uh, where Charlotte is, uh, Charlotte is, uh, is uh, they are in Berlin, and uh, Charlotte is uh, traveling to Vienna, and uh, and she is uh, she enjoying or she she is fulfilling as uh, so in this new situation. And uh, could you please? Uh, uh, read us uh, some part of, of Philip's book about this particular moment, uh, which is quite important for the life of this family. So we should say maybe that this is a quote or um, the diary of Charlotte, or is, from the, is it from the interview? I don't know. It, it, it's, it's, well, what it, it's, which bit precisely are you reading first? Well, as, as, as how I understood Matthias is that he wants to read me um, um, the story in 1938. So this right? when, she, when she's on the Holden Plains. Yes. Yes. So just to explain to everyone, um, the material that was in Charlotte's archive, we're talking about 9,000 pages. The vast majority of it in German, much of it handwritten. There is a lot of contemporaneous material, about half is contemporaneous material, a, lot, a bit more actually, two thirds. Um, in the war period, year by year, their diaries. But then at the end of her life in the 1970s and the 1980s, she's trying to produce a record of her husband, Otto, for the children to, if you like, enhance his reputation. And she goes back and she meets some of his old comrades who are still alive and she writes a series of, she calls them reminiscences. And in 1977, she writes a reminiscence in 1978 of the events at the Heldenplatz that took place 40 years earlier. So it is a notebook, it is a diary, it's not written in 38, it's written in it's 1978, perfect. looking back mm -hmm. at that period. The morning after arriving in Vienna, I ran like a mad woman from one place to another to try to find any old friends of Otto's who were in Austria, or rather in Vienna, and who, who could summon Otto from Berlin to Vienna. This wasn't easy. Zeiss Inquart was away, traveling to meet Hitler, to receive him at the border, or meet him in Linz. No one knew anything. It was unbelievably chaotic. Even the porters didn't know who was in which building, room, position, seat, etc. The government at the Bundeskanzleramt was dissolving. The head of the police had stepped down and no replacement appointed. It was all hither and thither. Then I heard that Globochnik, Globus, who was the go-between during the illegal time, was in the security building at the court. I rushed there, and after searching the building from top to bottom, I found him in a room on the second floor, I think, enthroned in front of a desk. He recognized me straight away and asked what I wanted. 
I asked him to call Berlin and get in touch with Otto, to ask him to come to Vienna so that he could be at the parade on the Heldenplatz on 13th March 1938 as the Führer marched in. Globus, who was rather slow and circuitous, said, that's not possible. The telephone lines are all blocked and where can I get hold of him and how can I give him an order without consulting? I slammed my fist onto his desk, made him jump and said, Otto sacrificed everything for the party, which he's been a member of since 1923. He risked his life, he lost everything, and he's not going to be there on the 13th March? What are you thinking? Herr Globus, is this our reward that he can't be there for the greatest day in history? Then nothing is worthwhile. What do you want me to do? Asked Globus. It's a difficult situation and there's only one day to go. Give me the order that you're happy for Otto to come, I blurted out. If you can do it, please do so. He said, can I take it seriously? I said, yes, I order you to let him know, Globus said. And so I ran to my parents in Belvedere Gasse with a happy, grateful heart. I immediately picked up the telephone and although all lines were blocked, I put in a call to Berlin. Oh, I can still remember. It lasted three minutes and cost 90 shillings. A lot of money, but was well worth it. In a couple of hours, I got hold of him in the office of Obergruppenführer Rodenburg, the most senior supervisor of the refugees. He came on the telephone and, full of joy and pride, I said, In the name of Globochnik, I hereby order you to make an immediate departure for Vienna in order to be here when the Führer marches in. It was quite a surprise. He asked me a couple of times if this could be true. I reassured him that it was and hoped he'd get to Vienna in good time. I was so happy because I knew it was a miracle to have been able to get hold of him. I'm sure that Globus thought I'd never be able to make contact so quickly. Maybe he'd have thought twice about it. At seven o'clock, the next morning, there he was, in the doorway of my parents' flat in Vienna as a Brigadeführer in his black SS coat with white lapels and SS uniform. In spite of the strain and the fatigue, he looked splendid. He washed, had a coffee, made a quick phone call, then we headed straight into town. His chauffeur was ready as well. Oh, what a feeling it must have been to be able to see his hometown after four long anxious years. He returned at midday with two tickets for the balcony of the Heldenplatz. There were only a couple of hours until the great event, so we were very excited. On 13 March 1938, we went into town in the big Mercedes and looked for our friends and the place we'd been assigned. The Fishbergs, the Leers, and others were all there. And suddenly, we heard a loud cry in the distance, which turned into an overwhelming cry of joy. Heil Hitler. It approached like a surging human sea getting closer and louder. The road to the Heldenplatz was completely full, people standing shoulder to shoulder, all the way up to the Rathaus around the Ballhausplatz. It took a lot of time and effort to clear the route. The Führer was standing with a raised hand, greeting the crowd, which was shouting excitedly a spontaneous and heartfelt outburst of joy. Everyone was carried along the feeling of heartfelt joy. So we could, we could dive in the story and feelings of Charlotte, uh, thanks to Katya's voice. 
and uh, so what but i understand so what you said philip that uh, so this was uh, uh, the, the whole book is is based on uh, on uh, material from the family and this is quite a complicated complicated puzzle of different pieces of memories family family memories uh, delivered by charlotte through this reminiscence delivered by horst and what did horst do with that so what did horst do with that after reading all this material through the years and also after the conversation with you and Niklas Frank. Well, it's it's true that the book is largely based on um, the materials that Horst gave me, but it's not exclusively based on that because as you go through the material, you see that there are quite a few gaps. Um, uh, it, it's possible that the material was originally written more complete, but I suspect it was not. The gaps concern what uh, Otto did in his day job. And so my job was to fill those gaps, uh, to uh, tell the reader what was going on as Charlotte was living through this joyful experience to the people who were on the receiving end, if you like, of Otto's work fully supported by Charlotte. And so it's a story that takes place in a sense in a double or triple narrative. The reader is listening to Charlotte and Otto because we have a lot of letters from Otto which are extraordinary while he is on the run and while he's at work because they kept up throughout the war an entirely uh, detailed correspondence. And as you will have seen from this reading, which Katya, if I may say, has just done magnificently, she can write. She captures a moment that took place 40 years earlier and you feel in her writing the energy and the passion about a moment that she's describing. She brings it alive and you are almost there on the Heldenplatz with them. And I've never read anything that mm. is quite uh, as vivid in capturing that. So Horst has lived with this material for many years. It was kept by his mother until she died in 1985. She then passed it on to his brother and his brother then passed away and it ended up with him. And he has obviously spent a lot of time going through it and he has bought into his mother's vision of her husband, his father, an honorable and decent man. Now I want to be very clear about one thing. Horst is not a Nazi and he is not an apologist. He accepts entirely that millions of people died in that terrible conflict, millions of Jews and probably at least a million Poles. And he does not deny that. And he doesn't deny either that his father had a role in what happened. He accepts that his father as governor was mechanically involved. But his take on it is complex. His take is, yes, my father was involved, uh, but he really didn't want to do bad things. He was an honorable and decent person, and he was doing what he was told to do, not um, uh, because he wanted to do it. And let me give you an example. Uh, I mentioned before the letter uh, sent in December 1939, darling Charlotte, tomorrow I have to have 50 poles shot. So uh, I read that text and my interpretation is that he's describing his role as governor of Krakow, responsible for the execution as a reprisal killing ordered personally by Adolf Hitler of 50 poles because a couple of Germans were killed in a police station in Bochnia, and it was 25 Poles per German. A horse looks at the text, he pauses, and he says, you see, what he says, Philippe, is, he, I have to have 50 Poles shot. Not, I want to have 50 Poles shot. And he takes refuge in that type of text. The second example, uh, I spent a long time uh, looking for the actual act of indictment of his father. Uh, he didn't have it. He had never found it. His mother didn't have it. Uh, and I found it in 2014 and showed it to him for the first time. Actually, it's a scene in the film, My Nazi Legacy. Uh, I found it again in a, an archive via the Holocaust Museum in Washington. It was in Warsaw, uh, produced by Polish and American authorities. It's an extradition request. Uh, and it describes in terms black and white, 
wanted for mass murder, uh, Otto Wächter, the mass murder of 100,000 Polish citizens. That's the exact language that it says. So I, I remember the moment, well, so I show it to Horst, he looks at it and he pauses and he goes, yes, of course. And I'm thinking, what's he going to say now? How's he going to get out of this one? And he says, it's not a Polish document. It's not an American document. It's a Soviet document. It was the Soviets who were hunting him and it has nothing to do with justice. Mm -hmm. So every set of facts that you give him, he is able in some way, not I think out of his love of his father, but out of his love of his mother. He will say to me, I didn't love my father. I didn't know my father. He was away when I was growing up. Uh, but my mother loved him. And I think the story of this relationship and the story of why these things continue is of um, uh, affection for his mother because his mother has placed his father on a pedestal. He has to place his mother on a pedestal in order to protect his mother. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a sort of misplaced filial affection that is, I think, by the mother. But these things are complicated. And over the course of 10 years, I must confess, I have failed completely as an advocate. Uh, not only have I not persuaded him uh, of the crimes of his father, but I would say that his view now is even firmer that his father was a decent man because he's constructed an artifice for himself. However, and I don't want to give away for the readers because it is a bit of a detective story and it is, as Katya said, a bit of a thriller, there are surprising things that happen and that get discovered uh, that cause the reader, I think, to doubt the sincerity and honesty of Horst's position. I don't want to say anything more than that, but it, it's, a, it's, it's an unexpected read. Mm -hmm. Katya, uh, so what do you think about this, uh, this uh, father-son relation and uh, mother-son relation. So did, does course represent so unique case, or is it, is it, do you see maybe film material for in that? So the what is it, what 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 is it, is it the broader phenomenon? Uh, how it seems to see um, from from uh, from from the broader perspective. So the, so is it is it what 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 was interesting for you in this in this relationship within the family, and also in this mechanism of Daniel uh, and dealing with history with family history by Horst. I met uh, Horst, and I also met uh, Niklas, the son of Hans Frank, through Philip. And uh, we spoke, and they were—they are totally different um, characters, of course. Even though coming from the same generation and being born from, you know, giving birth, uh, having a father, having fathers who are mass murderers, and how heavy is that to carry through your life, you know? And I think uh, to grow up and to realize where you are coming from and to to seek in yourself if you kind of inherited something of this personality within you this is the question and i know that that nicholas he spent his entire life to hate his father and to write against his father and it's really hard to read the book the father written by nicholas frank about his father hans frank but what happened is that his daughter who's my age she's free from this you know in a way she she's free she knows of course her story so and um i was thinking when i was reading the book and especially when i was talking to 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 horst in vienna it reminded me a little bit, if you remember the chancellor in Germany, Helmut Kohl, who was here in 89, you know, during the reunification of Germany. Um, and he was married uh, to a woman, Hannelore Kohl, who then finally killed herself because she had this allergy against light and sun. And she, she herself, she had a Nazi father and she never admitted father so much and she so she and we were trying to make a movie about that and they asked me if i would 
play this, but I, you know, it's, I can't play Nazis anymore. It's enough with this. So, but, <laughs> but uh, it was so interesting to read how she exactly would, what Philip is, is talking about, always trying excuses to maybe not lose the love to your mother or to your father, you know? So I think of, of being born with this burden, this is, um, this is so hard. This is so hard and, and you make it of course worse if you don't admit what's, what is actually happening. And, and, and again, if you ask me what is surprising, so if you meet, if you meet um, this, this old guy who's living in this Schloss and this old castle and who's really polite, don't you think? He's really, he's so friendly, you know, horse. He's really friendly and, and he, in a way he wishes he could change you know, the circle of, of history, something like this. I don't know. So. so it's a quite important part of the book is this part, uh, which is devoted to, uh, to the, the last years of, yeah. of Otto Wächter in Rome. Philip, uh, so why did Wächter attempt to use the title of Ratchline to South America uh, from Rome, if, as it seems for me, so it seems for me to, from the book that he was relatively safe in Rome. So after all, he could have thought that he had influential allies, as for example, some of the bishops of Vatican, uh, and you found that also Americans knew about Vesta in Rome. What is this? The, what is the sense? What was the sense of for Vesta to use this rap line or to try to use this rap line? You know, it's a really interesting question that you ask, but the complexity of life is, it's always back with, easy with the benefit of hindsight to look back on what was known. You have to imagine the situation as it was on the 29th of April, 1949. Otto Vechter has been on the run for four years. For three years, he's been hiding in the Austrian mountains with a young former Waffen-SS soldier called Burkhard Ratman, who I met, who only died last year, uh, and who told me what it was like to be on the run for three years in the mountains. That was pretty extraordinary. He moves to Salzburg. He is spotted by a neighbor who threatens to report him to the Soviets because they're in the Soviet zone. And um, he then decides he will cross the Dolomites on foot in February, which is incredible. Uh, and he makes his way through Bolzano and Toblach to Rome, where he arrives in April 1949. Now, he and his wife believe at that point, and they were right to believe it, that he's being hunted. He's being hunted by the Poles, who have already killed many of his friends. They've executed, hanged in criminal legal proceedings in Poland, many of his close friends who've been caught. Globocznik, who to any Pole, would be, I would have thought, a most terrible name, Globochnik, who literally organized the construction of the extermination camps, Sobibor, Treblinka, Belzec, directly on the orders of Himmler. He commits suicide. And he thinks he's hunted by the Soviets, by the Poles, by the Americans, by the British, by the Jews. And he wants to be safe. And he has heard about this path to South America that has been already traveled by Joseph Mengele. Uh, Adolf Eichmann will follow the path soon. Uh, Eric Priebke and, and hundreds and hundreds of others. So he thinks to himself, well, if I get to South America, I'll be safe. He adopts a false name, Alfredo Reinhardt. He arrives in Rome. And then it gets complicated and interesting from a researcher's perspective and a writer's perspective because we have all the material. But the problem is it's all in code. The problem is all the names have been falsified. So we have to spend four years researching who was who truly when he goes to visit an old comrade at Lake Albana, he never gives us the name of the old comrade. When he's met at the railway station in Rome by the um, uh, religious gentleman, he doesn't tell us who it is. I, we know now who it is. When he's met by Giovanni or Bauer, these are false names. And what he doesn't know and it is incredible, I didn't know about this story, was that he has walked into 
the Cold War. Italy was the center of the Cold War because the Western powers were worried that what had happened in Poland would happen in Italy. That the Soviets would set up a foothold. And so an alliance was created between the Vatican, Italian fascists, former SS intelligence officers, and the Americans and the British. And whilst the Americans are receiving requests to capture Otto Wechter from the Polish authorities, and you've seen the documents, I found them, they're in the book, it's incredible. The Americans know exactly where he is. Now at this point, I have the great fortune of turning to one of my neighbors in London where I live, who happens to be, I don't know anything about Cold War and espionage, you probably know a lot more about it than I do. You're Polish. Everyone I'm assuming in Poland knows more about it than I do. But I have a neighbor who is a writer of this period. Uh, his name is John Le Carre, uh, David Cornwall, and he's a good friend. And I go and see him and I say, look, this is, I don't understand what's going on here. They know where he is. Why aren't they capturing him? And, uh, David Cornwall Le Carre says to me, well, amazingly, you've sent me the materials. You've shown me some of the documents. I have to tell you, I was there. Yes. Yeah. This there? is this is good recommendation uh, for reading the book. So Philip, <laughs> neighbor of John Le Caire. Um, uh, so Katya, could you, yes. could you could you read uh, us this part, this small fragment of the book, which is devoted to to the day of 13 July 1949 in Rome. So the day quite important for Otto Wächter. Yes. Rome, 13th July, 1949. The condition of the men in bed nine was great. An intense fever and acute liver condition meant he was unable to eat or focus on the matters of ambition and desire that propelled him throughout his life. The notes at the end of the bed offered scant information, and much of it was inaccurate. On July 9th, 1949, a patient by the name of Reinhardt was brought in. The date was right, the name was not. His real name was Wächter, but its use, were, but its use would alert the authorities that the patient was wanted for mass murder, a senior Nazi. He once served as a deputy to Hans Frank, governor general of occupied Poland, hanged three years earlier in Nuremberg for the murder of four million human beings. Wächter too was indicted for mass murder. The shooting and execution of over 100,000 people. The estimate was low. Reinhardt, was on the run in Rome. He believed himself to be hunted, hunted by Americans, Poles, Soviets, and Jews for crimes against humanity and genocide. He hoped to get to South America. His father was identified in the notes as Josef, which was correct. The space to record this Christian name was blank. Reinhardt used the name Alfredo, but his real name was Otto. The patient's occupation was described as writer, which was not entirely wrong. Otto Wächter wrote letters to his wife and kept a diary, although the entries were few and, as I would learn, written in shorthand or code that made them difficult to decipher. He also wrote poems and, more recently, to fill the empty hours of a man in need of destruction, one film script and a manifesto on the future of Germany. He gave it the title Quo Vadis Germania. Philip, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 so this why uh, Americans took no steps to apprehend this Alfredo Reinhardt, a man indicted for mass murder. So they they knew about him, uh, and you disclosed CIA documents concerning Wächter, 
in the years af immediately after the war uh, when he was living in Rome. So the, according to your knowledge, are similar documents available also for other uh, war criminals? And how do you assess this post-war recruitment of criminals by the US from today's perspective? Well, it's pretty tough, isn't it, Mateusz? It's a bit of a shock. Um, someone's indicted for mass murder by the Polish authorities, 100,000 people in the indictment. In fact, it's in excess of 500,000 people. And um, uh, the Americans knew where he was all the time. And I got the story, as I said, from Le Carre. He was there, he was 18 years old, he was a young soldier. And his role in 1949, based in Austria, in Linz, was to interrogate German prisoners. And I said, what? To decide which ones to prosecute? And he said, no, that was the confusing thing, to recruit them. And I said, what do you mean to recruit them? And he said, because we had a new enemy. He said, it was very confusing for me. I was 18 years old. My whole life I'd been told the Nazis were the worst of the worst. But now we had a new enemy, the Soviets, the Bolsheviks, and the Germans, and particularly the German intelligence officers knew who their supporters were in Western countries because they had occupied those Western countries. So the German SS officers knew who the partisans were, knew who the Italian communist sympathizers were, and we wanted their Rolodex, we wanted their address book. We were engaged in that new war and we turned a blind eye to what was going on. Now, that was why the system of international criminal justice ground to a halt already in the late 1940s, because there was no desire uh, to proceed and to prosecute. Instead, and we knew it about the scientists, we know that scientists had been recruited, Werner von Braun being the most famous. What I didn't know was that they were recruiting intelligence officers, SS intelligence officers, people who were themselves mass murderers. And that, I think, is, is, is deeply troubling but it enables uh, me as a lawyer to understand the political realities of the situations. It's firstly, things are never quite what they seem. And secondly, politics is always an absolutely filthy story. Uh, and uh, we uh, learn that right now. I mean, Katya evoked Europe uh, today and the direction that is being taken. And we see the alliances that are now being created across Europe and across the world, yeah. which raise eyebrows in terms of who is willing to do business with whom and under what conditions. Nothing is what it seems. And we are on the cusp, I think, again, of making alliances between countries that are going to cause an, an awful lot of problems. I mean, interestingly, of course, you know more about this than I do. Poland is right at the heart of this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Philip, as an attorney who specializes in human rights, and Katya is an observer of injustices in the world. So, what is, according to you, so the significance for victims of injustice, the no, of non-punishment of the crimes committed against them? So, so in in your opinion, uh, for example, of what importance is the failure of us of our world? to punish Vesta for these people from Bohnia, from Lvov, from Krakow, for, for these Jews, for these Poles, for other victims of injustice? Well, it creates a space. I mean, you know, a horse can look me in the eye and say, my father died an innocent man, and you as a lawyer have to accept that. And he's right. I have to accept that. His father was indicted, but his father was never caught. His father was never tried. His father was never convicted or sentenced, and therefore he went to his grave as a man who had never been found guilty of a criminal offense. And the son is therefore able to mine a deep hole which concerns the innocence of his father. And this is the complexity of a system of criminal justice. I mean, you understand this in other countries. It's understood in Germany, where many people who were deeply implicated in the Nazi regime, went on to positions of great power and authority. And it led, of course, to the Red Army faction and various other things. But you know it also in Poland. Many people who were deeply implicated in the collaboration with the Soviet occupation went on to wealth and power in Poland and are in a situation of wealth and power today. 
and this creates an enduring sense of injustice um, which upsets some people and leaves other people content and rather happy that's the reality of human existence no i think one thing that that is very important for me to say is this is not a book about germany or about austrians or poles or ukrainians i mean in the country in which i live the united kingdom you know i went to school where no one ever talked about slavery um uh, you know or, or, or colonialism and this is a subject that has never been integrated into british society and people today are simply unwilling to recognize the harms that have been done and so the impunity continues the space continues in which people can refer to the past greatnesses of their countries without ever really engaging in historical facts and that i think creates a space for a writer for a lawyer for a historian to basically explain that these things are a lot more complex and of course they're universal themes and one of the things i've wanted to do in writing this book is speak with a sense of detachment a slightly neutral voice that I adopt. I don't judge Horst Wächter. Uh, I do judge Otto Wächter, and perhaps it could be said that the book is an attempt on my part to do a form of rough justice in relation to Otto Wächter. He was whitewashed out of history. He was one of the great criminals of the regime, and everyone forgot about him. And that means that for people who were on the receiving end of his crimes, and that includes my grandfather's family my polish grandfather's family part of my role as a grandchild i suppose is to put a spotlight on what happened and readers can then form their own view i don't impose a view on the readers as to what the conclusions are i just lay out the material and you've asked me a lot of questions that you're not alone in asking these questions uh it creates a bit of a shock for people and it you know it's a jolt uh but but history is complicated and in particular family histories are complicated and family histories are a reflection of the bigger historical picture, I think. Katia? As Philip said before, um, I think even if it's 80 years ago, I can feel it every day because I'm living in Berlin. So this was a divided city. We had the wall here. We had the separated country, which actually was separating the, the, the entire continent. Now it's gone since 30 years, but nevertheless, you can see uh, how, how differently in the East and former East and former West part of Germany, the, restrict, uh, the, the, the view on the um, uh, national socialism was done in the, in, at school you know, in the books, etc. It was totally differently done. And then when the wall came down, you could see that all of a sudden these things were happening in the, in, in the east part of, of, former, of, of Germany, you know, which were very right-wing. So, and I think what, what Philippe gives us with this book is, as he said, that if we read it, and it's not judgmental, it's, it's, it's stories, about factual stories about a family and about people who were running this horrible regime. But I think we all need to read and start thinking for ourselves. Because what we know nowadays is how Nazis look like. But they're still here. They just have, they wear a different costume. And they maybe not raise their hands anymore. But they're still among us. And it's, for, this is for me very important that I look back to, to be alert and to learn from the, from the past for nowadays, you know? This probably has to do because I'm German, although my, my, the family of my mother was killed by the Nazis, so for different reasons. So, but I think it's so important that we educate us and that we speak out that it stops to continue all these conspiracy theories that we can now read uh, in the internet, in all these unsocial networks, you know what I mean? And then just follow, following this mainstream instead of thinking for ourselves. And this is so important. And Philippe's book gives us, gives us um, yeah, supports to, to start to think for ourselves. And let me just add one more thing, which, which is so, um, hardly to believe that in this 
red line times was actually there to support. And if you look at Croatia nowadays, what the Catholic Church is doing right now, you know, closing the Balkan route, etc., and how very right wing they becoming. So it makes me, you know, it makes me anxious. Seriously. Yeah. Uh, this is the message to all for over over seventy participants in our room. But if you want to ask the question, please write this question in Q and A button so at the bottom of the screen so uh, uh, Philip uh, Google. One, uh, yeah. so in one uh, uh, of the final passages of the book of your book you write uh, that uh, it's more important to understand the butter than the victim do you think uh, you have understood the butter so after all you did, so uh, during this process of researching yeah. this book and yeah. writing this book and all the conversations with, with family, with horse, with other people? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, I think I know Otto Wächter and Charlotte Wächter. I know what motivated them. I have sized them up. You know, when you read 20 years of letters and diaries of a human being, you get a feel of the kind of person they are. Um, Emma Hansen has asked a question on the basis of Charlotte's diary. Some of the information is very personal and intimate. Was there anything you decided to leave out of the book and why or why not? I mean, it's a very good question. Um, if I left stuff out, um, I think it would have been subconscious. My view was to give a composite picture. One of the things I was very keen to do um, was I promised Horst I would fairly and accurately report his views. In other words, I wouldn't criticize them. I would just let the reader form their own view. And that seemed to me to be the honorable thing to do. And so there is a degree of repetition in a certain sense, because over 10 years, in a certain sense, you know, Horst is like Groundhog Day. It just keeps coming back always to the same arguments. But I think it needed it in terms of the rhythm of the book to maintain that repetition so that people could see the positions that he was taking. There is indeed some intimate stuff in the material. I mean, Charlotte has a number of abortions. Uh, I describe those. Uh, Otto Wächter has many lovers. I describe those. Charlotte Wächter remarkably has passions for certain other men. There are at least two that um, are written about in some detail. And absolutely, I decided to include that because I think it's through our private passions that we really understand the person. And in particular, we were stunned to give an example. Going through her diaries in 1942, it seems that she fell in love with Hans Frank, unbelievably. I mean, you literally could not invent it. Um, she develops a massive crush, almost like a teenage girl. They can't be in the same room together because it's too dangerous. She dreams about him. She imagines all sorts of things with him. She wanders around Vienna with him. I mean, it's incredible material. And when I sent the material to Nicholas uh, in the original German, he wrote back to me the most marvelous email. He just wrote back, he said, dear Philippe, this is sensational. Perhaps I am Horst's brother. Uh, which I thought, you know, which I thought was just, you know, in the midst of all the horrors, in the midst of the final solution, in the midst of the reprisal killings, in the midst of discussions of divorce and everything, what are they talking about? They're talking about sex, they're talking about affairs, they're talking about love. It comes back to what Katya said. They are ordinary people in every way indistinguishable from the kinds of people we see in society today, from our politicians, from our leaders, from our regular folks, from our husbands, from our wives. And in response to Emma's question, you need to see that material in order to be able to understand uh, the person. Um, Aaron Kroch-Malnik has asked the reaction of the daughter of Nicholas Frank. I, I mean, Katya had mentioned her um, 
Francesca, who is a remarkable person and who has also become a good friend and who I'm in touch with very regularly. She really liked the book. She found the book immensely powerful. I'm not going to give away something else. Uh, a number of you may have heard the podcast um, and it gives a lot of the story, but not the whole story. And in particular, the reason I did the podcast on the BBC, it's free, you can listen to it. It's called The Rat Line. Um, the reason I did the podcast first was I suspected that people would come out of the woodwork, that I would get communications from people. And so the right at the end of the book is the largest surprise of all in the book. I'll just give a hint, it's about future generations. And that blew me away. Uh, life is um, immensely, immensely uh, complex. Um, there's a question from uh, Olga Borislavska. Um, why did I take it upon myself to change Horst Wächter's image of his father? And that's a very fair question. To be honest, I didn't take it upon myself. What happened was, you know, Nicholas introduces me to this interesting character. We go together the first time, Nicholas and I, to Hagenberg. And I'm just fascinated by Horst. I mean, as Katya said, he's really a sweet and gentle person. And I like him. And I feel, in a curious way, quite protective of him, even though I don't like his views. I mean, the understanding that I've come to for myself over the course of now 10 years is that he, in a sense, never stopped being a child. He never stopped being the six-year-old child whose world collapsed in 1945. And his entire existence has been about recreating the comfort and the security of those early years, which by all accounts were very happy years for him as a child, both with his mother and his father. And I never took a conscious decision. I never assumed I'd write a book or write, make a film or anything. One thing led to another. And at each stage, I would say to Horst, well, okay, you know, the BBC wants to make a film. Do you want to make a film? And if he'd said no, that would have been it. It wouldn't have happened. But he didn't say no. He said, yes, let's do it. And then he didn't like the film. And then a few weeks later, he got back in touch and said, no, no, let's move on to the next bit of the project. This is interesting. And that was the podcast. And after the podcast came out in 2018, he didn't like the podcast. And then a few weeks later, he got in touch and said again, well, actually, come on, let's continue. This is interesting. And interestingly, he's now had the book for a month. I haven't heard from him yet. Um, I mean, I sent him little bits and pieces and I suspect he won't like the book, but I suspect also that there will be a change of direction. That said, I don't think there is any more of this uh, seem uh, to be mined. I think the material is there, people will form their views and I need to move on to next project, so to speak. Uh, Katya, so there is a, the question uh, from uh, Olga Borisławska to you. So do you see this question? Oh, no, I haven't checked yet. Oh, it's a key. Is, why are you suggesting that the children of the historical figures are expected to bear wide of judgment and responsibility for the decisions their parents made? To bear weight of judgment and responsibility for the decisions their parents made, conditioned by the circumstances believed. Oh, those are such a long question. Oh, my goodness. Um, why I suggested that the children of the hysteria are expected to bear? If I suggest I don't think you, I don't think you, I don't think you suggested that. I mean, I'm, I'm very clear that no. Horst is not responsible for the sins of his parents. No, no, no. I, I didn't say that either. I just say that you are born and you had these parents and now you have to deal with that situation all of your life. You know, that's, that's that's all that's all i'm I mean, saying of yeah. course of course um they're, they're your parents they gave birth to you of course even if they're not there if you know if they if they escaped or if they were hanged or killed themselves whatever so both of them grew up without a father i mean uh, uh hans and and uh horse uh niklas and horse um but nevertheless of course you you care for your family and where you're coming from, right? That's what I was trying. Yeah. I mean, I can answer a question that's come up actually also, which is related to this from Paul Alexander. Um, there is one question, does Horst have children? Yes, he has one daughter, read the book. It's one of the most fascinating aspects of it. Um, I, I would say uh, in response to, to Aaron Krochmalnik, Paul Alexander has asked the question, 
how has researching and writing the rat line in East West Street changed me? And of course, that too is a very big question that we could spend hours talking about, which I'm sure people don't want to do. But I would say it's changed me in terms of my own engagement with my family past. It's made me feel much closely, much more closely connected to that past, because if you like, faceless, nameless people suddenly come alive. But in relation to the conversation that we're having now, there's one aspect that I think has been very important for me. In meeting Nicholas and Horst, I have been forced to confront, if you like, the other side of my own story, uh, namely um, the children of the perpetrators. And I feel a great deal of humanity and empathy towards them. Katya made the point, and this is a powerful point. I had never thought about the burden that the children of Hans Frank and Otto Wächter live with. And it is the most enormous burden. In my classes, I sometimes ask my students, can you imagine what it would be like to have a father who was hanged for the murder of three million Jews and a million Poles, as Hans Frank was? To live with that every day as a child and as a grandchild is so enormous, it is almost impossible to imagine it. When Nicholas Frank tells me how, on the day of the 16th of October, 1946, he was seven years old, he was a schoolboy, and he's playing in the playground, and his friends in the playground are laughing at him because his father is going to be hanged that afternoon. I feel empathy for Nicholas Frank, because as a child, he has no responsibility for what his father did, but he has to live with this terrible, terrible burden. And so um, these, that has changed me. Uh, having, having come to know Nicholas and Horst has been, in a sense, a privilege. It's been difficult. It's been a long journey, but it's been enormously important. And I think I'm the better for it, I have to say. I've been, I've been forced to engage with other histories. I've been forced to engage with the history of Poland, the history of Austria, the history of Ukraine. And I try to understand the perspectives of the different people that I meet from their perspective. And sometimes this is very difficult. You know, I'm standing in a field in Ukraine near the town of Brody, where they are recreating uh, the Waffen SS Galician Division's last battle with the Red Army. And there are people wandering around in SS uniforms. And the hundreds of people there are celebrating the Waffen SS. And when you speak to them, they'll tell you, you know, we had lived under the Soviets who were not good to the Ukrainian people and along come the Germans. And if the Germans come in and get rid of the Poles and kill the Jews, well, okay, that's the price we're willing to pay for us to go and have a better life. It doesn't justify in any way what happened, but I think it's very important as a writer to see things from the perspective of others, to see things from how a different community looks at a particular issue. And that is, that is what I've learned, and that is what has changed me. This is one question asked in Polish by Jerzy Gapis. So uh, I translate it. For, so how uh, this normal, decent people uh, were able to, to, to be responsible for death of thousands of people? So how could seemingly decent people uh, become embroiled in such terrible things? I can do no better than Nicholas Frank in answering that question. He was asked that question. We did an event together in London at the South Bank, he and Horst and I, and someone in the audience asked him that question. And he gave a, an answer that had been obviously the product of very great reflection. He said, it's a lack of civil courage. It's that certain human beings have a lack of civil courage. And that is not a German condition. That is a British condition and a Polish condition and an Austrian condition and an Australian condition and an Argentinian condition. It is the condition in which when a human being finds themselves confronted with the choice of a government that is doing things and they have to decide whether they will put their own interests or those of their family before the interest of the greater good and the issue of principle. And I think most people, most of the time, 
will save themselves and save their own families. Um, I express no judgment on that. I think that's what most people would do. And faced with a Nazi situation um, or the rise of a semi-fascist government, as is happening in parts of Europe today, most people are doing exactly the same thing. They just want to put their heads down, not confront these issues, and take the easy path. And that is what most people do. And I don't and have never thought that Nazism or what happened under Nazism is a peculiarly German thing. I think any community is capable of doing terrible things. And it happens for the reason that Nicholas explained, a lack of civil courage. And I think the crucial question is that at certain moments in time, you have to stand up for what is right, even if you pay a big price for that. And most people, probably understandably, aren't willing or able to do that. Uh, so the next question is uh, by Bernd Wogenbach uh, to Philip. You work as prosecutor, you deal with the capability of individuals looking into history. Have you come any closer to finding an answer to the question of where guilt actually begins? Where we as human beings make ourselves guilty through our decisions and actions? Oh my word, these are complex and wonderful questions. I mean, we could have an entire university course for a year on your question, Bernd. I mean, what a question. You know, one of the techniques you have in the courtroom is you get these huge questions and your job in dealing with judges to reduce them to something that is manageable. Talking about the culpability of individuals, let's look at Charlotta, okay? Sure, she didn't pull the trigger on anybody. She didn't kill anybody. She didn't imprison anybody. What did she do? She provided succor and comfort to her husband. There is a crucial moment in the book, just after the section that Katya read out, this extraordinary moment where Otto and Charlotta stand within one meter of Adolf Hitler on the balcony overlooking the Heldenplatz. What happens after that? They go inside, and we know this because she records it, she writes it all out. They walk down the vast marble staircase. I've been down that marble staircase. Some of you will also have been inside that building and you know the marble staircase I'm talking about. And at the bottom of the marble staircase, they stop and they look at each other. And Otto turns to Charlotta and says, so what should I do next? I have two options. I could continue my career as a lawyer and I would be very successful and I would make a lot of money. Or my friend and comrade, Arthur Seisingfart, has offered me a job in the government. What should I do? Now, at that point, the spouse has a certain role in most family lives, my own family life. When I reach a crossroads, I ask Natalia, my wife, okay, I've got two options. What am I going to do? Charlotta embraced power. And she embraced power for the next seven years. She loved it. She loved Bayreuth. She loved Salzburg. She loved the stolen property. She loved the looted art from Poland, the Bruegels, the Falats, the Dürers that were stolen from the Czartoryskis in Krakow, plundered by her personally. And we have that from the director of the museum describing her walking in to the Czartoryski Museum in 1939 in December and saying, this is what I want. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And she supported Otto in his work throughout. What is his first job? State commissioner removing Jews and other undesirables from public office. He removes about 16,000 people from public office. And it's not just anybody. These are not just faceless names. Two of the people he removes from public office are his own teachers at the law faculty in the University of Vienna, not unknown people, his dean, the man who was dean, the man who signed his graduation certificate. He removed him from his position. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of that, that man was sent to a camp and was dead within a year. That is Otto Wächter, that is Charlotte Wächter. She is deeply implicated mm -hmm. in a moral sense. Yeah. But I think she may also be implicated in a criminal sense yeah. because she stole art from yeah. Poland, and that is a crime. 
David Zutter asked about Charlotte. Did she remain a committed Nazi the rest of her life? Is there any evidence of her reconsidering her views and her uh, husband's actions in later years? Plenty of evidence, no reconsideration. The second time I visited Schloss Hagenberg, uh, Horst was married to a rather wonderful woman, a Swedish socialist, actually, very different background. And there were family difficulties because of this. Uh, Jacqueline, a ra rather impressive lady, unfortunately, she died of cancer whilst this whole project was going on. But on the second visit, she whispered in my ear, she was a Nazi until the day she died. And uh, when I said that publicly, at a certain event that I was at with Horst when he was defending his mother as a decent lady. He said it was untrue, but happily there was someone else who'd gone with me on that second visit, which was the photographer from the Financial Times newspaper. And she said, oh, Jacqueline said exactly the same thing to me. Um, but more to the point, the archival material is really extraordinary. Uh, Matez, you'll recall that not only are there documents, but Late in life, at the time that she was writing the reminiscences, Charlotta um, went and decided to uh, hold conversations with old comrades, and she recorded them on an old cassette tape, and Horst sent me the digitized conversations. So, for example, there was a conversation in April 1977 in the restaurant of the Four Seasons Hotel in Munich between Charlotta Wächter and a journalist called Melita Wiedemann basically a Nazi, fascist, anti-Semite journalist uh, who was very close to Heinrich Himmler. And they're sitting there eating away and there's the drinking of glasses and they raise a toast and they drink to the good old days. This is 1977. And then Charlotta says, you know, I was, I was a very committed Nazi. And Melita says, so was I. And Charlotta says, still am. So I'm afraid it's a lifetime commitment to the cause in the case of Charlotte Wächter. Uh -huh. So the, the question uh, by Kerstin von Lingen, uh, by having read the book, which is fascinating to read, what I find most disturbing is the complete absence of mercy of the perpetrators with their victims, while at the same time we see them as loving individuals, fathers, partners, friends, and music lovers talking about opera and concert. My question goes to you as an author. How did you balance or select in your book the wealth of material? You had accounts of victims and then the diaries and memoirs of the Nazi side, as well as our high documents and photos. Did, do you follow your own interest, which then guides us as readers through it? It's, um, it's, a, really interesting, um, it's a really interesting question. Um, in the end, it's not a legal book and it's not a history book, it's a book by a writer. I wanted my audience, the audience that I really care about, is regular, ordinary folk who um, are just interested in these things. And in order to write a book of this kind, you need to construct a narrative arc which takes them through the story. You don't want them to stop reading at page 37 because it's too boring and tedious, as are many of the legal books that I've written. So in the act of selection, the first question that I ask myself is how can I make this material interesting for a reader who is not a historian or a lawyer or a university academic or uh, you know, working for the Valetsky Foundation? Um, and that's the first test that I take. But, but the second question is on the other hand, it's gonna be read by people like Kirsten von Lingen and by my colleagues at my law faculty and by lawyers and historians that I admire and respect. And so it must be accurate, it must be footnoted or endnoted, um, it must be reliable. And I worked with some remarkable PhD students in translating the material. Obviously there are always mistakes that are thrown up and I'm immensely grateful. I mean, I just sent off a first tranche of just 20 relatively minor changes, but readers spot mistakes, the street name is wrong, or the date is wrong, or the name is wrong. And I want to hear about that, always I want to hear about that. And if there are more serious errors, I want to hear about that too. But the simple answer, Kirsten, is I wanted to write a book 
that would sell 500,000 copies. And the reason that I wanted to do that was that I want a broad audience to read this material and form their own view. There will be academic books that I've written that I'm deeply proud of that of course don't sell that amount, but the audience is different and the purpose is different. And so it's written consciously to capture that audience. Okay, so could you look, Philip? So because there are many questions, maybe maybe you can look and choose which one there, you there, want there, to there are there are many questions, dear Matej, but I'm afraid I uh, we've, yeah. we've gone on a little beyond the time, and I've got a I've got a com I actually have another job as a lawyer, and I have a conference call, uh, yeah. which I have to make. Is, so so I I agree, and so, so we so because there's the half past seven. And we should uh, uh, finish our wonderful uh, conversation. Uh, I uh, I want to I want to uh, thank all the participants. Uh, I want to thank uh, first of all to thank uh, Philip, to thank uh, Katya, and uh, uh, to thank our interpreters, Carolina and Gisela, uh, to thank Marek uh, for technical assistance and to thank to all participants. Uh, I would say also that uh, our next meetings also online uh, on uh, June the 3rd, uh, Andrzej Szczerski of Jagiellonian University and National Museum in Krakow will talk about modernism and modernization practices in the Second Polish Republic. And on the 9th of June, uh, Nick Waxman of Birkbeck College, London, and Piotr Sapkiewicz of Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Museum will discuss the problem of Auschwitz as a part of Intelligence Action, and it will be the debate to mark the 18th anniversary of the first transport to Auschwitz of Polish prisoners from Tarnow to Auschwitz camp in 1940. That, that will be the, 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 the seminar with Nick Waxman and Piotr Sadkiewicz. And now I want to, once again, so the, to thank uh, Katya, to thank Philip, thank you. and to thank all participants. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank, thank you so much. And stay safe. Stay safe, exactly. Bye-bye. <laughs>